Hello everyone, welcome to my channel today. If this is your first time here, my name is Corey and I take people like you with my family through the Bible every year. And you know, part of my contribution to Bible Discovery and Bible Discovery TV is being able to bring you context to your Bible study, being able to introduce you to some history and some cultural studies, some biblical archaeology and research that you might not otherwise have heard of. And it is my absolute joy to do that. And today's interview is right along those veins. So my guest today, it's very exciting uh, for me to have our guest on today. He has some really interesting research out and available to the public now on the Genesis 10 character of Nimrod. But our guest today is not at all limited to Nimrod. Dr. Douglas Petrovich is a pastor. He's a scholar. He's professor of biblical history and exegesis at Brooks Bible College. And he is the author of not only many scholarly articles, but of now three books, his latest being on Nimrod. I have it here, so I'm going to show you. Nimrod, the Empire Builder, Architect of Shock and Awe. I'm almost all the way through it. It is a very, very interesting read. So Dr. Petrovich, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Corey. It's great to be with you and with your listeners. Yeah. And you know what, Dr. Petrovich, one of the one of the things that I really appreciate about Nimrod the Empire Builder, you know, as, besides just the subject matter in general, is the fact that you've written it in a really ex accessible way. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to my husband about this before we started recording and and he said, yeah, it's it's as if he's taking top shelf ideas and handing it out to anyone who who is there. Yeah, and that's part of my passion. Um, I don't want to just write articles that only speak to the scholars because, Corey, between you and me, and this is a secret, most of them won't believe what I say or won't agree with anything <laughs> I say. They're fixed in their ways and they're unchangeable. But I know that, especially with God's people who have humble hearts, who want to learn, who want to compare everything, you know, like the Bereans, compare everything they hear from Paul with the scriptures. And I'm convinced that if we give people enough um, to kind of chew on, that it gets them excited about the Bible, they, uh, their faith is affirmed and confirmed as being historically true. So there's so much to be gained, and, and that's why... My main audience is people who are as I am, just people who love God. And I think um, and my hope is that this book is written to and for them. Yeah, I definitely think that bears out in the style of writing that that you've chosen for for this book. And, you know, that's I when I was doing a little bit of research on you before uh, to, to introduce you, to be able to introduce you, uh, when I found out that you were also a pastor, I was not surprised because I find when scholars are also pastors or they have pastoral experience and pastoral care, that it's such a beautiful thing because you have people in mind and and everyday faith in mind, not just the scholarly academic world. Absolutely. And I agree with you. In my estimation, the best scholars I've come in contact with out there, at least among Christians, is um, the scholar, the Christian scholars who have a ministry with people and have pastoral background and realize that it's, it's way more than information and facts. It's about people's hearts, people's lives, uh, people's walk with God and, and fleshing that out in how we live. Yes, absolutely. All right. So this, I, I don't think that, that most people, when they think of a book that they're going to read, most people, I don't think, think that there would be enough information available on Nimrod to even, to even write an article, let alone an entire book. So why, why this book? Why this subject matter? Well, first of all, Corey, uh, to say that I'm ambitious is an understatement. So uh, I'm always willing to bite off more than I can chew. But ultimately, it's about one main thing, and that is when you're convinced that God makes you responsible for passing along truth and knowledge to others, you just have to act. So that's really kind of the summary of it. But there's more to it than that. Humanly speaking, I took an archaeology of Mesopotamia course. It was one year long in my Ph.D. program. That was at the University of Toronto, Canada's flagship university. And I, there's a whole story behind getting into this class. And, and, and it's, it's a really kind of amusing story in God's economy. But um, essentially in that class, I started studying historical figures, especially of 
of ancient Mesopotamia that I maybe hadn't studied as detailed before. And as I read the biography of one of these characters, and this is Sargon of Akkad, I'll, I'll put it out there. I'll kind of allow you to read the end of the book right now. Um, Sargon of Akkad, I realized, you know, his biography just seems to be so similar to that of Nimrod. And I said, I just wonder if he's the right guy for Nimrod. So I started care studying the Nimrod story in Genesis 10 more carefully and translating it for myself, studying, making sure that I've got the right words and the right understanding of what's going on. And comparing that then to Sargon's biography, it just dawned on me, oh my, th this is one and the same person. He's the right candidate for Nimrod. So that's how, how it happened. And then I published a journal article on this topic. Uh, it's a peer-reviewed journal article in a um, very reputable Christian journal. It's called the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society, about 13,000 words long. And of all of the um, documents that I've uploaded and the things that I've put on, on my academia.edu webpage, and by the way, I'll just pause and say to your, to your listeners, um, if you want to know what the real Facebook is in the world, it's not Facebook. It's academia.edu. Why? Because whatever your field is or your fields of interest, you can find scholarship on academia.edu that you can literally download for free. Hundreds and thousands of articles and great materials. So I really strongly encourage everyone to be part of academia.edu and benefit from it. But anyway, on my pages on academia.edu, um, People clicked on them over 158,000 times to date, right? And out of everything they clicked on, all the documents that I've uploaded for them to journal articles to read for free and a couple of books of the Bible that I translated are up there. You can read my translation and so forth. Out of everything I uploaded, the thing that people have clicked the most is this obscure article on Nimrod. And I, I stepped back when I realized that and paused and I thought, you know, I just don't understand why people are so fascinated with him. You know, I was, but I didn't think so many other people would be. And when I realized that there was that great interest, I thought, you know, I think it would be a wonderful thing for me to do what I always wanted to do, which is to expand on that article, turn it into a book and make it more accessible, not just for scholarly readers, but for the average um, non-specialist and put it out there. So it's now a 70,000 70, page book as we speak. It's a brand new book. I uh, just came out in uh, late October of 2023. Yes, it's, it's it's so interesting. This is it's this is the kind of thing that I love. It really gets me going when when we were able to take the Bible and 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 expand it out. I'm I'm so excited about that. Now, there's only three places in the Bible that Nimrod is even mentioned, right? We've yep. got yep. Genesis 10, and then we have um, uh, just a chronology in First Chronicles 10, just like a shortened version of what we find mm -hmm. in Genesis 10, and then one other reference in Micah. So I figured for our, for our listeners today and for our readers today, I would just read that. Now, I'm going to read it just from the ESV. Okay. Uh, just so that everyone is clear on what we're talking about, uh, if they're thinking to themselves, Nimrod, what, what do you mean? <laughs> Yeah, who is he? All right, so I'm going to read Genesis 10, 7 to 12, and I'll pop it on screen for everyone too. The sons of Cush, who I'm definitely not going to pronounce right, just heads up everybody. Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteca. The sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth-ur, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. So then 1 Chronicles 1 just contains a shortened version of that. I think it just says, Cush fathered Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And then, but Nimrod's interestingly associated with Assyria very closely in Micah 5 verse 6, which is centuries and centuries after Moses would have written <clears throat> Genesis 10. And Micah 5 verse 6, again in the ESV says, 
uh, when the Assyrian come, oh, that's five, verse five, hold on. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and he shall deliver us from the Assyrian. So really closely associated there uh -huh. with the land of Assyria. Now, I read from the ESV, but in your article and also in your book, you provide a different translation of Genesis 10, verse 7 to 12. It, it differs at a few points from, uh, I think, what, what most people would read in their uh, English Bible. So why did you do that? Why do you think that the verses specifically in Genesis 10 needed to be revisited? Sure. And just big picture, um, I think it's important to note that God is a God of precision, right? I mean, he put earth specifically in this habitable zone around the sun. If the earth moves just a ways closer to the sun, then probably uh, things are completely dried up. And if he, if the earth was to move a little bit further away from the sun, the water sources would freeze up. So we're, we're in the precise place, our planet, where it needs to be within our solar system. And, and that's, that's just a reflection of God's um, personality. He's precise. And being that I've studied the biblical languages and I've taught all levels of Hebrew and Greek, I've been waiting to teach Aramaic, but I haven't had the opportunity. Um, it's important to me to, to understand what are the issues in the original languages in which the Bible is written. Um, and to do that, you have to know the languages. And so uh, when I look at somebody else's translation, here's the danger that you run into. It goes back to something that my uh, seminary professor, Dr. Robert L. Thomas, used to say to us. He said, in fact, he, he said this specifically to me once when I asked him a question. He said, Doug, the danger with standing on someone else's shoulders is that you both may fall. Mm -hmm. So that being true and being that I have been taught very well, very thoroughly in the biblical languages, it's my responsibility to to translate it for myself, to grapple with the issues myself, and to come out with a text that reflects what's actually written. And that being true, when I approached the text, uh, the typical English translations behind the text of the story of Nimrod, I realized that there were some, there were some imprecisions there. Uh, the ideal wasn't met. There, there was some confusion, maybe even some accidental misleading. I certainly wouldn't suggest that any of the uh, translators of any of the translation committees behind any of the standard English translations were out to mislead anyone. That's, that's not the point, but they're not quite as um, precise as possible. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So in Genesis 10, 8, most English translations say that Cush became the father of Nimrod. That's a little bit misleading. Cush can't be the actual father of Nimrod because an exhaustive list of Cush's sons was presented in the verse that came before that. In fact, that list even includes several of Cush's grandsons. So clearly Nimrod is not one of the sons of Cush. Therefore, maybe there's something better that we could say other than that he became, uh, that Cush became the father of Nimrod. So a closer study of the actual verb that's used in Genesis 10, 8 shows that this word for siring actually is used of, um, or it includes the use of remote ancestors with remote descendants. In other words, multiple generations apart, such as Jacob is described as um, having fathered children of Isaiah's day, which is around a thousand years after Jacob's lifetime. Jacob can't be the father, mm -hmm. the literal father of these Israelites who live a thousand years later. It, it can't happen. So why does it say that he sired them? Well, that verb has to be understood not just as a father to son or mother to daughter or that kind of relationship, but it's, it's uh, far broader. So um, Nimrod is not a son or a grandson of Cush, and he instead is a remote descendant. So a better translation of Genesis 10, 8 is that Cush sired Nimrod, meaning that Nimrod was a later part of Cush's bloodline. And one of the biggest inaccuracies uh, in English translations of the Nimrod story is when these translations state that Nimrod became a mighty one on the earth. And then it says, 
or they read typically, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So there are three problems here I want to point out real fast. Uh, let's start with maybe the smallest of the problems, if you will. The name for God here where it says the Lord, it's not actually the right translation from Hebrew. The word for Lord in Hebrew is Adonai, and that's not the word that's used here. This is the covenant name of God. Um, if you if you go to Exodus 3, when God introduced himself to Moses, and he gave Moses these instructions, he's to go to Egypt and take his people out and all of this, Moses said, okay, that's all well and good, but they need to know who sent me. Who is it? Who are you? And what did God say to him eventually? God said, I am has sent you. Oh, I am. What does that mean? Well, what God chose in his, what became his covenant name with his people, with his covenant people, uh, he emphasized his eternality. One of his, in theological terms, we call this one of his incom incommunicable attributes, an attribute, a quality, a characteristic, a characteristic of God that he can't impart to us, right? We can't be all powerful and create a universe like God can, right? So that's an incommunicable attribute. Well, his eternality is also an incommunicable um, attribute of God. So when God says, I am, the Israelites then refer to him, not in first person, because God says that as of himself, that's first person, right? If we're talking about someone else, that becomes third person. So third person, it's a participle in Hebrew, which is typically or usually Yahuwah in Hebrew, but the meaning of that is what's important. It's from the to be verb. It means he is or the one who goes on existing. So it's a little bit more accurate to call God what he says he is, the one who goes on existing, he who is. So that's the covenant name of God. A smaller problem is with the choice of this term, a mighty one, to describe Nimrod. Now, technically, that word is not wrong, but what does it do? It invokes positive characteristics, such as David's mighty men, who are these valiant warriors defending the king and serving him in a godly way. But this isn't at all what Nimrod was like. He wasn't godly in any stretch of the imagination. Instead, he was a vicious murderer who captured cities, and he killed people who opposed him. And he instilled fear into the hearts of people. So I think a better translation for, for this uh, term in Hebrew is a powerful one on the earth because it avoids that positive connotation that clearly is not true of Nimrod. And now let's get to the most serious problem in that portion that I just translated for you. So the most serious problem in uh, Genesis 10, 8b and 9a is when translators state that Nimrod was a mighty hunter. And when they use this term, they miss the point completely. Nimrod was no explorer out on safaris, <laughs> hunting wild animals to put onto his trophy case. I love the idea. I love the passion. I, I love the hunting spirit, but that's not what it's saying. The proper translation here is that Nimrod became a powerful slaughterer in the sight of he who is. And the Hebrew verb here uh, has cognates or equivalents in other Semitic languages. Hebrew is a Semitic language, so it has like sister or cousin languages. And these uses uh, refer to sacrificial animals that are slaughtered so that they can be used as burnt offerings to pagan gods. So the typical expression is a sacrifice of slaughtering. And obviously this means when you take an animal that's alive, usually with a blade or something, you, you cut it, it bleeds out or you strike it in the head or something. But the, the problem is that you, you then take that animal that is now dead and you cut it into pieces and you put the pieces on an altar and you burn it up. So Nimrod slaughtered entire populations of cities as he engaged in a campaign to subjugate the entire civilized ancient world under his control. He was not a hunter of wild animals who enjoyed safaris. He killed thousands of people and he did it ruthlessly. So that's a picture of a portion of this text that I think needs to be brought under a, a brighter light, scrutinized and maybe understood 
in a way that the original author intended it. Yeah, and I think that's so important because, I mean, you you when you put it in context, just in the context of Genesis 10, where even if it says Mighty Hunter, even if it's translated Mighty Hunter, then it goes on to describe that he's conquering cities and building up cities. So you see right, right. away, okay, okay this, this shouldn't be animals, this should be... So are you saying then that this is more of a word picture that the author that Moses is using and putting on Nimrod for us to understand like how brutal he was? Absolutely. That's the whole point. The, the author, want, Moses, in my estimation, yes. Moses wants us to see and, um, and kind of be taken aback by how vicious this man was. And, and like you said, this is so important, Corey, the point you made, I, I want to just kind of hit home with this for a moment. When I teach a class on hermeneutics, which is the study of the interpretation of the Bible, uh, I mention, and I was taught this by others, so I wasn't the person who invented this, but the three most important principles of interpretation are these, context, context, and context. And what is the context of, as you said, even if you translate it Mighty Hunter, what's the context? He is out knocking off cities one at a time, and he's going through the map and spreading his conquest as he goes. So he wasn't on safari trips to find animals that could, you know, fit his interest that would, that would, you know, match well with the other ones on his trophy case in his house. That's not what was going on at all. So whatever, whatever he was doing, whatever characterizes his actions, his exploits, it has to be something that's in line with what's in the context. And that is a conqueror of cities and what ancient, let alone modern, but what ancient people ever invited someone to come and take over their city. They don't do that. This is an aggressive uh, act of, of viciousness that he uh, participates in. Yeah, that seems to be extremely fair, given, given the context here. Okay, so something else then that you do a little bit differently than I think is the norm to what people think is that you disassociate Nimrod from the Tower of Babel. Why do you do this? Great question. Um, first of all, I'm not the only one to see Nimrod as different from the Tower of Babel. So if anyone thinks, you know, I'm kind of all out of my own, I'm not. I'm willing to be if I need to be, but I'm not. <laughs> so I didn't invent the concept. But hopefully I'm at least one of those who's leading the charge to try to correct this mistake. So I would say there are two main reasons for doing this. One reflects the understanding of a historian, and that's part of who I am. I, I, I consider myself an interdisciplinarian, which means that I um, attempt to have a good understanding of multiple disciplines or fields, right? And one of those fields is history. And the other reflects the understanding of a biblical exegete, and that takes into account my background in uh, the study of the original language. So um, let's start with Moses's literary structure in Genesis. And I talk about this more in my book, and if you really want the details, it's all there, but I just want to highlight one example from this. But um, it has something to do with Moses's literary device that he uses in the book of Genesis. Now, he uses various devices. I don't want to imply there's only one device, but there's one that I want to focus on, and that is this. What he tends to do, he tends to give you kind of a, a large scope of a story. There's a beginning point and there's an end point. And he usually goes through it with somewhat of a, well, there's some speed and rapidity involved in this. He wants to take you through it. He wants to hit the high points. And, and usually in, in that section, and I call it the 40,000 foot view. It's like you're in the airplane flying over top and you're looking down 40,000 feet. Um, he even uh, dispenses with the details and the less important people that, he, that he's not going to elaborate on after he finishes this section, right? So what he'll do is he'll do that 40,000 foot view. And then when that's over, you would expect that he would continue the narrative like in a chronological way and keep going beyond that. But oftentimes he doesn't do this. Instead, what he does is he goes back to that 40,000 foot view and he, he takes you and he parachutes down with you all the way down to the ground. And you land at a certain point on that timeline and now he gets out the microscope and he takes some things on the ground there and he puts it under the microscope and he starts showing you these things and, and really going into or elaborating on the details. So 
the one example I'll share, and there's several I could um, could offer, but uh, the example that I'll use is Genesis 1 and 2. And I really break it down differently than that. It's not quite so easy. Genesis 1, 1 through 1, uh, through 2, 4, and then 2, 5 through the end of chapter 2, which is whatever that is. I forget the last verse, 30 or 31 or something. So, but basically Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 is the 40,000 foot view. Moses is showing you the quick outline of everything that happens. He does it chronologically. How do we know that? Because Moses himself tells us, this is day one. After that, this is the second day. This is the third day. This is the fourth day. This is the fifth day. This is the sixth day. And then on the seventh day, God rested. So that is a clear indication. He's screaming out at his readers, I'm giving this to you chronologically. Then what does he do beginning in chapter 2, verse 5? And, and it's funny because when I was a student back in my first university class in the 80s, the professor who wasn't a believer, um, he said to us, you know, you can't trust the Bible if for no other reason because it's got two different creation accounts. There's the account in chapter 1 and the account in chapter 2. And because they're different accounts and they conflict with each other, you really have no reason to believe there's, there's any validity in either account. And that bothered me at the time, of course, when I was, a, whatever, 18 or 19 year old. And I wish at that point I could have known how to address that and, and counteract it like I know how today. And here's the, here's the counteraction. Chapter 2, starting in verse 5, is that parachuting down and looking at the details of what he talked about in chapter 1. Which day of creation was it? Because it had to be within that time frame, right? It's day 6. The focus is on day 6. So what is he doing when he gets the microscope out with us with chapter two? It's easy. He's putting the emphasis on what's most important in that whole narrative from the 40,000 foot view. So chapter one, more or less, of Genesis has an emphasis on the order of creation, right? It's the order. But chapter two has an emphasis on the pinnacle of creation. So. $65,000 question, what then, pray tell, is the pinnacle of creation? Here it is, you and I. Mankind, male and female, we are the pinnacle. Why? We're the only ones created in the image and likeness of God. That makes us special, different than all the rest. So what is Moses doing with chapter 1 and chapter 2? Two different conflicting creation accounts? No. One account, blow by blow, hitting the high points at 40,000 feet, and then he zooms down in on one moment on day six, and he blows it up under the microscope, and he gives us the details. And this is what's going on with mankind because mankind is the pinnacle of creation. So what's the point? The point is this. Just because you read about that, in chapter two, it doesn't mean it comes after day seven, the day that God rested. Because what Moses is doing is he's pulling you out and taking you back into uh, that timeline and dropping you down in, in a moment there. So what does that have to do with our text? Well, here, here's where it comes to bear. The story of Nimrod is in Genesis 10. So if all of Genesis is strictly chronological, which I don't believe, but let's assume for a moment it is, then the Tower of Babel events that start in chapter one, chapter um, 11, verse 1, those events have to come after the Nimrod events. Now, um, I have a problem with that as a historian. Um, and, and actually, there, there's a way to show how that, you know, you can, you can um, relate the Tower of Babel events to a specific moment. It has to do with uh, the story of in chapter 10. And so chapter 10 is the big picture. It's the timeline. It's like Genesis 1. It's the 40,000 foot view. And in the, and there are three genealogies. There are three um, genealogical trees, one of them being that of um, Shem, Noah's son Shem. And in that, it talks about a division that happens in the days of Peleg, one of the descendants in that genealogical tree from Shem that, that goes from Noah all the way down to what will become Abram, right? So that's that's our important chronological ladder that we're going to crawl across, if you will. So all that to say, we can fit 
Genesis 11 back into the narrative in Genesis 10, just like we can fit chapter 2 into the narrative of Genesis 1. But here's the point. The point is um, the events of Genesis 11, 1 and following happen after, uh, happened before the events of Nimrod's life that's recorded in Genesis 10. So what I'm suggesting to you is that it's out of strict chronological order. Now, as a historian, and this is how it's going to connect, as a historian, I have to make this obvious but vital observation. Babel, and that's the Babel of Genesis 11 and tw um, 10 and 11, not the, not the Babylon of Daniel's day, but the Babel of Genesis 10 and 11, that was the first urbanized city. The first urbanized city. Where you have things such as monumental architecture, a defensive city wall, you have an administrative government, you probably have canalization, which is the sewage and drainage system, and on and on and on. All of those characteristics that make it different than just a village, right? It's a true urbanized center. So what does the Bible portray Babel of Genesis 11 as? The world's, or at least post-flood, at least post-flood, the world's first urbanized center, a real city. So think about that for a minute. Nimrod was the first interregional conqueror of a multitude of cities. So think about that historically as a historian. So it must be considered completely illogical to propose that a story with many urbanized cities on earth, that is Nimrod's story, took place before a story with one urbanized city on earth. Such a model simply would not spawn from anyone with careful training in ancient history. The building of the Tower of Babel and the post-Babel dispersion clearly preceded the lifetime and the conquest-laden reign of Nimrod as a king who founded a kingdom and subsequently built an empire of captured cities. So logically speaking, even if we take away, you know, the literary device of Moses, logically speaking, there's just no way that the Tower of Babel events happen um, uh, after Nimrod, even though Nimrod comes in Genesis 10 and the Tower of Babel comes in Genesis 11. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And what I really, what I really, really appreciate those two points that you brought out, you know, first being uh, just the principle of pay paying really close attention to what the, the scripture is actually saying, really sitting with it and thinking about it, uh, because you're right, that logical sense of how is Nimrod conquering a bunch of cities if there's a, only one city with Babel. Like it doesn't, it doesn't add up. The math doesn't add up there uh, if Nimrod is at the same time as the Tower of Babel or before. So just sitting with it and really paying attention to what the, the details of what this scripture is giving us. I think if everyone did that, who is trying to interpret the Bible, we'd have a lot less uh, arguments and issues with each other uh, than than we do today in Christianity. But another another point that you drew out with Moses's literary conventions. I think is so important because if we, if when we're, you know, even just having a conversation, it's part of human communication to pay attention to how someone else reasons and how they speak, right? We know this in our day-to-day -day life. I can have a conversation with my mom. It's going to be a very different conversation than a conversation I have with my dad or someone on the street because they are different people and they organize their thoughts differently and they communicate their thoughts differently. And it's the same with the authors of the scripture. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit, but God allows them to use different literary conventions and allows them to organize and communicate information in such a way that makes sense to them. And so really paying close attention to that, not just here in Genesis, but all throughout the scriptures. Again, it's such a key principle for being able to interpret scripture properly. Well said, Corey. And you basically gave an advertisement for my favorite, one of my favorite courses to teach, which is Elements of Bible Study. Because if we're not studying the Bible carefully in ways that we're allowing it to say what the original author, uh, human and divine author, wanted, wanted it to say, if, if we're reading into it, if we're missing things, if we're not getting things according to their method of writing, then we're, we're automatically going to miss a tremendous amount of what we can glean or gain from the text that we're studying. 
So it's, it's all about careful Bible study methodology. Yes. Well absolutely. said. All right. So now that we've kind of talked about th these literary conventions and putting Nimrod in his right time period, th there's a whole other element here where now you have to try to identify a biblical figure historically. So where, where do you even start when you want to identify a biblical figure historically? And specifically in our case today, where do you start with Nimrod when you're trying to identify him historically? Sure. And I guess I could say in light of what we were just talking about, good Bible study method um, observations and interpretations and so forth, that's all part of it. But um, for that question, maybe we can start by studying and quantifying every possible characteristic of, you know, whatever specific person we're looking at in scripture. And we're trying to draw out what are those characteristics of this person? What do we know to be true? what is the biblical writer clearly communicating? And and really, Corey, we can, we can start by making a list, you know, a little Christmas list, one, two, three, four, five, and just, you know, numbering these things. So a great example is with, and, and an easy example is with the Exodus Pharaoh. And as you already noted to me, uh, I've published, and this goes back to 2006, a journal article on the Exodus Pharaoh. And to this day, as far as I know, it's still the most thorough study ever done on the Exodus Pharaoh. And what I did is I looked for the biographical requirements of the Exodus Pharaoh. So here are the kinds of things that I found that I realized if I'm going to try to connect the Exodus Pharaoh with a certain king of Egypt, then these are the things that must be true of him. And I'll just, I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list, but just kind of a representative list. So one, he could not have been a firstborn son. The, the Exodus Pharaoh himself, he couldn't be a, a firstborn son of his father. Why? because he did not die in the 10th plague. Clearly says in the Bible that all firstborn from, you know, the king on the throne down to the woman at the, um, at the millstone, everyone, the firstborn of every person and every animal was going to die. That's true. So that's one re biographical requirement. Second one, the Exodus Pharaoh, if, we, if we're identifying him with some Egyptian king, he could not have had a firstborn son who ascended to the throne because his firstborn son did die in the 10th plague on Egypt. So that's another requirement, okay? So his firstborn son had to die prematurely. He could not have risen to the throne. And in Egypt, Egyptian history, it's really convenient because there is a specific title that is given to the firstborn son of a king that no other child of the king ever gets, the king's eldest son. It's wonderful. So it, it limits who could be the eldest son of the king. Um, a third requirement for the Exodus Pharaoh, his predecessor, the king who ruled before him, must have ruled for over 40 years. Now, Moses doesn't say that in Exodus, but last I checked, the New Testament is just as inspired as the Hebrew Bible, right? So if you believe that, then you'll know maybe that Luke in Acts 7 specifies that the predecessor to the Exodus Pharaoh um, had to rule over 40 years because it was, because he says, describes that it was a 40 year span that Moses was out of Egypt in the land of Midian before he returned and um, at God's behest, uh, drew the people out of Egypt. So that being true, you have to find a king, an Egyptian king, whose predecessor, not he himself, but whose predecessor ruled over 40 years. And you know what that does, Corey? It really blows apart the, ex the uh, late Exodus view, which says that the Exodus happened in the 13th century BC, all of the Ramesside kings, right? So the typical view is that the Exodus happened during the reign of Ramses II. Now, Ramses II lived a long time. What is it, his reign? Something like, oh, it's really long, like this 67th year or something of his reign. Um, in that year, he died. So he clearly ruled over 40 years. But the Bible doesn't say that the Exodus Pharaoh ruled over 40 years, but that his predecessor did. So it means the successor to Ramses II could be technically the Exodus Pharaoh based on this requirement only. But um, Ramses II couldn't be. So 
That being true, it pretty much wipes out the typical late Exodus view, even though late Exodus proponents, you know, they squirm in their seats when they hear this and they try to find a way to, to get themselves out of the straitjacket, but they can't, there's no way out of it. So um, these are the kinds of uh, details that we're looking for in the Bible itself to, to give us a list of these qualities or characteristics that must be true or, or exploits, whatever the case may be, must be true of this, this uh, given character that we're trying to focus on and look at. So um, these are the kinds of details that the Bible student must sniff out like a bloodhound if he or she wants to connect a biblical figure with a historical person. <clears throat> and with Nimrod, we start with requirements su such as this. He was a king, right? So you can't get away from this. It's a requirement. He was a king. Why? Because the text itself says that his kingdom began in a certain place. So if there is to be a kingdom, there has to be a king. Second thing, his kingdom had to be a massive empire. Why? Because he controlled powerful cities in both Shumer, which is southern Mesopotamia. The Bible knows it as the land of Shinar, if you're just going to transliterate from Hebrew into English. Then he later expanded to the north into Assyria. And Assyria is a vast land of its own. And it gives representative cities of each land that he conquered. And that being true, I think it's a very fair statement to make that he didn't just uh, capture or control three cities of Shumer of southern Mesopotamia and four cities of Assyria. These are just the tip of the iceberg. It, it wants to, you know, Moses wants to quickly draw your attention to several important centers that Nimrod conquered. And then probably, you know, you would think, you would assume that he built up and made a part of his um, subsequent kingdom. So, so um, his, so that's very important. The, the, the kingdom had to be a massive empire but it, because it included uh, virtually, if not all of southern Mesopotamia and Assyria to the north. And then a third characteristic is his kingdom had to begin in Shumer and then later expand into Assyria. So what that does is it gives us, if you will, a chronological flight plan. It had to start in southern Mesopotamia, his kingdom, and it had to include, not be limited to necessarily, but include Assyria to the north. So that limits a lot of kings and, and crosses a lot of candidates off the list of possible figures that could connect with biblical Nimrod because not many kings um, actually are empire builders. There aren't that many. And of those, not many at all start their kingdom in southern Mesopotamia and expand it into Assyria. So this really limits the field. So those are some of the things that we can look at. Yeah, and so that partially answers my next question because there's a few other candidates for Nimrod or at least an association with Nimrod that people have put forward. I think one of the most popular ones that's going around at least in lay circles is to associate Nimrod with Gilgamesh. So, mm -hmm. um so is this the reason then that you would reject these associations just because they don't uh, match up with the biblical criteria? Yeah, and I devote, I forget what it is, a whole chapter or part of a chapter maybe to um, the idea of looking into these other, and, and I'm mainly focused on the, the scholarly suggestions that have been put out there by credentialed uh, biblical scholars. Um, and I looked at three, the, the three most popular ones. And it's not, a, again, that's not an exhaustive list, but I looked at the three most common um, figures, apart from Sargon of Akkad, who've been propped up as maybe this guy is Nimrod. And, and I'll get to Gil Gilgamesh last, but the first option that's put out there by a very highly reputed scholar is Amenhotep III. He's an Egyptian king. He ruled from 1407, according to my chronology, from 1407 to 1370 BC. So why is he a bad candidate for biblical Nimrod? Well, problem number one is that according to prob uh, proper biblical chronology, Moses died in 1406 BC. That means, that means Amenhotep III, his rule began just the year before that in 1407. Now think about the logic here. What possibility is, is it that 
He could have built an entire empire conquering cities all over the map, all in one year's time for Moses to hear about it and then quickly write um, a story about all of that. Mm, that just doesn't really work. So the second problem with Amenhotep II is that he never even campaigned in Assyria or Shumer, let alone conquered them. So he becomes an impossible candidate just based on his biography. And we know enough about his reign that we can be very confident that he didn't conquer cities in this territory, let alone even take a trip there, according to history. So he's a bad candidate. Um, one other candidate, and I would call him, Corey, a bit of a, a surprise candidate for scholars. But the second candidate, his, his name is Ninurta. Ninurta is not even a human being. He was the Shumerian god of the suther southerly wind, meaning the wind associated with the south, and he was the god of war. So, yeah, the god of war part we get, that makes sense. Uh, you can certainly say, I mean, if Nimrod knew anything, it was war. But think about Ninurta, okay? Nimrod had to be a human being of human lineage going back to Adam. Why? Well, the text is clear. We, we already talked about it. His lineage goes back to Cush, who derives from Noah, right? So he had to have this human lineage. He can't be a god. And the Bible is very clear that gods who are worshipped by people who are no more than wood, clay, stone, precious metal, right? They're not actually living beings at all. So Ninurta um, immediately is not a possibility. Nimrod descended through Noah's son Cush, who clearly is a human being, not a god or a demigod. Um, so Ninurta really can't be an option. And then we come to Gilgamesh. So what's my problem with Gilgamesh? Well, the first problem is that there is a dispute about whether Gilgamesh even was a historical figure. We have so little attestation to his reign. In other words, almost no inscriptions, almost no historical sources that refer to him. So scholars even disagree with one another about whether he's truly a person who lived on earth. So that's, that's a potential problem. It's not a problem we can't overcome, but it's something that needs to be weighed in to it. But even if we can assume, at least for the sake of argument, that he was a historical person, he was a king, that will grant him. According to what we do know from history, he would have been the fifth king of the city of Uruk. Now, the city of Uruk, I'm going to try to prove in my fifth book, and of course my Nimrod book is my third book, but in my fifth book, I'll try to prove that Uruk is the kind of, um, it's the kid brother or the younger sister, however you want to look at it, of the city of Eridu, which is the world's first uh, urbanized center, the first true city as we know cities in the ancient world. That's Eridu. Not Babylon, but Eridu. And Eridu is located in very southern Mesopotamia, very close to the Persian Gulf. Uh, and where the actually it was where the Persian Gulf originally when it was first built um, it was where the Persian Gulf meets the Euphrates River so but over time of course the um, the Persian Gulf receded with its with its northern um, 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 boundary or line and the uh, the course of the Euphrates River actually changed in antiquity so but anyway close to Eridu is Uruk and, and Uruk is a very, very early city. It exists going back all the way in what's called the Ubaid period. The Ubaid period is the, the general or larger period of Mesopotamian archaeological periodization that precedes the period that I will connect in my fifth book to the post-Babel dispersion, the events of God's confusing of the languages. That occurs, I'm convinced, in the Uruk period, and specifically the subphase known as the late Uruk period. So, all that being true, what, what's my point here? My point is that Uruk was, was growing up alongside of Eridu, kind of as the second city. It didn't get all the ink and the print that you see in Genesis 11, but it was growing up at the same time. And when the Tower of Babel 
dispersion took place, the confusion of language and people dispersed from that city, uh, the city that the most people moved to, according to our understanding from, archeolo from archeological excavations, the city that's population grew the most after the events of what's called the, the Uruk expansion that happens in the later Uruk, um, later Uruk period, the city that receives the most people is Uruk. It blows up like a balloon. Why? Well, it's a simple theory. It's the bullseye theory. Um, if you go to a lake and, and, and that lake is still, right? It's smooth as silk. And you take a heavy rock and you toss it out into the lake. When that rock hits the, the water of the lake, what's it going to do? A bunch of waves will be created. Where are the waves going to be the biggest? Right where the rock hit the water. And the further you go away from where the rock hit the water, the smaller the waves will be, the less significant the impact will be on that still pristine lake. So that makes sense that the most people who would disperse from Eridu would be locating close by rather than far away. That's why Uruk's population expands enormously. So let's go back to Gilgamesh. So if Uruk was already a city growing up alongside of Eridu, which I'm connecting with biblical Babel of Genesis 11 and, and, and 10 even. So if, um, if Uruk is, is a city growing up alongside and the fifth king is Gilgamesh, that means he's the king of, of Uruk very early in Uruk's history, long before you even get to the, the period after the period after the late Uruk period, right? And so it's the period after the late Uruk period when you have Uruk expanding like a balloon. That's the Jemdet Nasser period. And the period after that is the early dynastic period. And that's when you have kings and cities warring against each other um, virtually ad infinitum. And, and they're all fighting for power and supremacy. So that being true, Gilgamesh would have lived at a time that's before this infighting between kings of southern Mesopotamia, the land of Shumer, biblical Shinar. So he becomes a terrible option for a king who has, remember, we talked about this already, he has a, a vast empire. He's conquered city after city after city, not only in his in his own area, the land of Shumer in this case, but he went all the way into the north and conquered into Assyria. This cannot be true of any king this early in history. So automatically Gilgamesh is eliminated from possibility. Does that make sense? It definitely does. And color me interested for book five and six. Everyone, Good. Keep, keep, keep your ears out, everyone. I'll let you know when they yep. come out. <laughs> okay, so not an Urta. Not Amenhotep III, not Gilgamesh. So the thesis of your book really is resting on Sargon of Akkad, as you've, yes. as you've mentioned. And in your book, you take the reader really interestingly through five main categories of correspondence between the biblical life of Nimrod and the life of Sargon of Akkad. So you look at geographical and genealogical origins, military achievements, you look at building projects in Assyria, his lasting influence in Assyria, and then legendary, how he's legendary for his military exploits and his brutality. So could you maybe take us through some of these, these ways that Sargon of Akkad corresponds with biblical Nimrod? Yeah, let's start with the, geogra uh, the uh, geographical and genealogical origins. So um, what we it, let's just assume for the sake of argument uh, that Sargon of Akkad, he's the right candidate. So if he's the right candidate, what do we know about his biography? One thing we know about him is that he came from the city of Kish. Think about that for a minute. He came from the city of Kish. I won't go into a lot of detail, but in that early dynastic period when Kingdoms are really starting to rise and kings are becoming more powerful and they're fighting with one another. In that period, uh, one of the cities that quickly rises to great prominence is the city of Kish, oddly enough. And Sargon gets his start. You know, how do you get from just a normal person to someone in, in a place of political um, uh, importance, right? Well, he becomes the cupbearer to the king of Kish at a time when Kish is 
not maybe necessarily at its height, but still very, very powerful and a very important player on, on the, on the chessboard of the ancient world. So now cupbearer doesn't mean to them what it, you would think it means to us. We would think, you know, kind of like a really lowly person, but the cupbearer has the equivalent in Egypt of a vizier, the second in command. That's how important a cupbearer is in Mesopotamia. So he has this really important position. And according to history, he doesn't take over uh, as a king for his father, right? In most cases, a king comes to the throne because his father was the king. And so there's this physical succession that goes on. So we're convinced that he was a usurper. Why? Because, because in his name, he, 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 um, he purports to be um, a non-usurper, a legitimate king. Now, if you're claiming, if you're showing as your advertisement, I'm a legitimate king, what is that saying? You're you don't probably, come from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't come from legitimate stock. Yeah, I'm the you, real you deal. <laughs> yeah, there's no real real deal here. Yeah. So, um, so he, by intrigue, he finds a way to the top in Kish. Now, think about who Nimrod comes from. His line descends from Kush. Now, as we spell it in English, Ancient Kish, the city of Kish, is K-I-S-H. In the Bible, we usually write C-U-S-H for Kush. It easily could be a K. It doesn't have to be a C. We could have chosen a K. Just like with the ancient city, we choose a K. And vowels mean nothing in the ancient world because in virtually every ancient language, not only are vowels uh, transferable, you, know, you can change the vowel from one language to another, but oftentimes languages aren't even written with vowels. Like Hebrew is not written with vowels when originally right. composed. So Corey, we don't even know if we've got the right vowel class for the first vowel that comes after the K consonant. Um, it could be a U class vowel instead of an I class vowel originally. We just don't know that. So um, there is a very strong possibility that that Nimrod as the descendant of Cush could be completely related to Sargon as the guy who took over at the city of Kish. So he took over at Kish and then he expanded his kingdom in southern Mesopotamia. And then Moses just lists for us three cities from a southerly to a northerly, northerly direction. Eridu, Erek, which is Uruk, and then Akkad. So um, that brings me to the second um, point to bring out to you. So we talked about the geographical and gene genealogical origins being similar between the two. What about military achievements? And I've already talked about that some um, in our discussion, but both men started their kingdoms in Shumer. That's important. And then both men expanded their kingdoms northward into Assyria, right? And again, very few ancient empire builders actually do this. So this is a, is a very unique characteristic that they both share. And related to that, both men brought the city of Akkad into prominence. And this is really important. It's well known that Sargon, the Sargon of Akkad, wouldn't you know, his capital city was Akkad. Now there's a problem with this, and that problem is we haven't located through archaeological discovery where is the city of Akkad. We don't know exactly where it is. So our understanding of this city is extremely limited, and it's mainly limited to other sources that speak about it kind of third person. So that being the case, again, we don't know enough to confirm certain things and whatnot, but we know enough that we know this. Clearly, Moses pointed the arrow to the city of Akkad with, uh, with Nimrod. So Akkad is one of the really important cities, not the only, remember, only three are given, but uh, Moses gives us three prominent cities that are connected in, in southern Mesopotamia with Sargon. There's Eridu, there's, it's really Babel, Babel in Hebrew, which I'm saying is Eridu. That's important because we read about that in Genesis 11. Uruk is important because like I just told you, the city that grew most in population after the Tower of Babel dispersion, if I'm right, is Uruk. So that's important. And then the third city is what? Akkad. Why is that important? 
it's Nimrod's capital if Nimrod equals Sargon, because the capital city of Sargon, without a doubt, according to many ancient historical sources, is the city of Akkad. So all that being true, um, this is um, a representation a little bit of the military achievements of both men being very, very similar. And then the third and final one I'll mention is both men initiated building projects in Assyria. And there was a really important uh, archaeological set of uh, excavations done at three sites in ancient Assyria, right around the time of Sargon of Akkad, a little bit before and a little bit after. What did they find? Well, the excavations were done at the sites of Tel Brak, Tel Leilan, and uh, Tel Mozan. And what they found was that before the Akkadians arrived, up in in um, in the north in Assyria, that they were not a very cultured people. Their technological advancements weren't that modern or state of the art. They were very simplistic people. Then all of a sudden, the, the Akkadians show up, and we see several occupational phases. Well, Sargon is the beginner of the Akkadian Empire. He's the one who first expands the kingdom into. Um, into Assyria. So we, we would be right to, to connect um, the occupational phases at the beginning of the Akkadian period at those sites with Sargon. Then later throughout the, the, um, uh, the Akkadian Empire, we see other phases of occupation going down to his grandson, at least, um, uh, Naram-Sin. So that being true, what we find at Tel Brak and Tel Leilan and Tel Mozan is all of a sudden you have immediately, as soon as the Akkadians arrive, you have these, these technological innovations that are brought there. This incredible um, irrigation system. You have these uh, defensive systems for the cities to protect them against invasion and so forth and so on. So basically, um, civilization strikes when? At the beginning of the Akkadian period. Who's connected to the beginning of the Akkadian period? Sargon of Akkad. So archaeology connects us in a physical sense with material cultural remains to, um, to a connection. It gives us a connection between Nimrod and Sargon of Akkad. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, now, as, as far as you're aware, this question is basically, is there another smoking gun? Is there any, any other king in history who matches even close to Sargon of Akkad when it comes to the biblical criteria for Nimrod? Great. And I would say very simply, to my knowledge, no, there is not one candidate who meets these kinds of criteria. You've got to have um, someone who controls all of Southern Mesopotamia. That's rare. Uh, you've got to have someone who expands into Assyria, conquers virtually all of the city, because again, the four that are cities that are listed there, they're just the tip of the iceberg. They're representative right. that, that this conqueror, this empire builder, he probably possessed all of Assyria. Who has such a resume? There just aren't candidates who can offer that. So, um, so, and I think it's important to remember that in order for a candidate to work when considering biblical chronology, that, that this king you're considering, he has to have completed his exploits in order for Moses to write about him no later than 1406 BC. Remember, we already eliminated Amenhotep III because his reign starts in 1407. So his kingdom has to be secured and already kind of in the annals of history by the time Moses is able to write about this sometime before his death in 1406 BC. So every candidate after 1406 automatically is stripped from the possibility of being the right person. But before that, I can't even think of one candidate who meets these kinds of requirements. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's no secret. I find I find your argumentation extremely compelling. And, um, you know, especially in light of the third biblical reference that we have to Nimrod in Micah and his association so closely with the land of Assyria so long after the actual physical life of Nimrod. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in your book, you have quite a large section that is 
uh, talking about the legacy of Sargon of Akkad and, and on how later kings would even fashion themselves after him. So, uh, you know, in light of all this that we've been talking about and, and Micah's connection and everything like that, why is this this concept of later kings fashioning themselves after Sargon? Uh, why is that significant for Sargon's identification with Nimrod? And maybe for people who aren't aware of these later kings trying to emulate Sargon, maybe you could give us a few examples of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, studying later empire builders actually doesn't really help to identify Nimrod with Sargon of Akkad. However, um, what it does is to help see how Sargon's actions were viewed carefully by other men who became empire builders themselves and used his achievements kind of as a model, as a blueprint for them to follow. So it's like the concept of a copycat crime, right? Um, I'm convinced that one of the greatest reasons why in the United States we've seen a real influx in crime over my lifetime, and I was born in 1964, is because of six o'clock news, 11 o'clock news. What do we do? We glorify crime. We put evil things, not great things happening, not good deeds, good Samaritans and what they do. We're, we're putting evil, right? Car chases, when someone is trying to outrun the police, we put these on, it gets viewers in mass. So what happens with this is we get copycat crimes. People who see other people doing crazy things on TV saying, you know, if I do that for myself, then I also can be on the six or 11 o'clock news. And so what do they do? They devise a plan, they go out and they, they do the same thing. So that's what these other empire builders do. And the other important thing is how Moses used Nimrod's story as a vaccine for future Israelite kings in Deuteronomy 17, he starts to talk about uh, what's going to happen when you have a, a king over Israel. For example, he said that they must not multiply chariots and they must not multiply wives, especially foreign wives. So basically Moses was listing the things that would corrupt them, the things that would, um, would uh, taint them, right? So Moses knew ahead of time that after he was dead and gone, the Israelites one day would put kings on a throne. There would be kings of Israel. And he wanted, in the Nimrod story, he wanted to vaccinate his people. What does that mean? To give them something to prevent them from getting a disease. What's the disease? Well, Nimrod's life is the disease. It's the epitome of what happens when you have an insatiable desire to get more and more and more, and more, yet more is never enough. You now have what nobody on earth has had before you. You have a kingdom of probably dozens or scores of cities in your possession. And you're sitting back and you're gloating and you're, you're kind of like Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember the story with Daniel, right? He had such great pride about his kingdom, his empire, that he boasted about it. And his boasting about his empire became so obnoxious to God that God did what? Sent him out in the fields and said, now you're going to live, Nebuchadnezzar, like an animal. Your hair is going to grow in an ugly way. You're not going to be talking to people like before. You're going to be mixing it up with cows and goats. So that's what you get if you put yourself in that kind of place. So what was Moses doing in vaccinating the Israelites? He was saying to them in a sense that when you get later kings, be careful. Because as a king, what you have, your domain, it may not be enough. So you may see the domain next to you, another city-state, uh, the Moabite lands or whatever, and you might say, we need to conquer their lands. We need to get more and more and more and more. And why is it that David was not permitted to build the house of God, the temple where God would live? Why? He was a man of bloodshed. 
going out and killing people. That was enough for God, who's holy, to say, even though God had this amazing, intimate relationship with David, and David was a friend of God, right? Um, he walked with God. God compared every other future king with David, and yet David couldn't build the house of God, no matter what that relationship was, just because he had gone out and killed so many people. Nimrod was a mighty slaughterer in the presence of he who is, the God who goes on existing. And, and so that's, um, that, that, that's a little bit of a picture of why it is that Moses gave this story to the Israelites, to open their eyes, to make sure they don't make the same mistake when they get kings to arise. So to finish your question, answering your question, some other examples that we would see of future uh, empire builders. And again, there, there's not a whole lot, but one great example is Hammurabi in the 18th century BC. He was an Amorite king who ruled out of Babylon, if you will. By that time, the, the Amorites had possession or control of uh, the city of Babylon. And so he expanded his kingdom and he had a very powerful kingdom, especially in Mesopotamia in the 18th century BC. And there were other cities that were part of this Amorite League of Cities that communicated with one another and they, um, they would have been engaged in trade and in uh, helping each other to fend off, undoubtedly, you know, fend off attack from, from attacking peoples. So there were cities like uh, Mari, which was along the Euphrates River. So Mari and Babylon were in cahoots and Mari had an incredible textual archive that attested to these relationships. And the city of, um, um, of um, oh, it's right near Tel uh, uh, It's something like Alaluk. I, I forget the exact name of the city. But then down in the southern Levant, the city of Chatzor, which becomes uh, the most powerful, the most um, populated city in all of Canaan, four times larger than the second largest city, and that's Lachish. So all of these cities throughout the Fertile Crescent uh, were part of this Amorite League during Hammurabi's um, kingdom, his empire. So that's one. Thutmose the third, he was an empire builder. The one true, I would call, empire builder for the Egyptian, um, for Egyptian history. And incidentally, he's the father of the Exodus Pharaoh. He rules over 40 years. He's Amenhotep II's uh, predecessor. And he hands the keys to the kingdom to Amenhotep II. What does that mean? It means that when God defeated the gods of Egypt with the 10 plagues, which again, it wasn't a fight between Moses and the Egyptian king. It was a fight between God and the Egyptian gods. So in that battle, um, God defeated the kings of Egypt and Egypt was at its height in all of its history from the dawn of time until today. Egypt was never more powerful than it was under Thutmose III. So he is another such empire builder, although of course he's, he's in um, Western Asia, not in uh, the Middle East and the, the, the center of, the, uh, of, of Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent. So then there are other kings such as Esarhaddon, he was the greatest king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the first millennium BC, and then Nebuchadnezzar II in Daniel's day. And then probably one of my favorites, he doesn't, usually in Christian circles, get as much airtime as the others. Alexander the Great, he was an amazing empire builder. He, his kingdom expanded beyond anything of the kings that preceded him. It went all the way to India and a little bit beyond. So his conquests were absolutely off the charts. And of course, he's prophesied about by Daniel uh, in several of the chapters of the book of Daniel. That's awesome. And and I could talk about these guys all day. I find it so, so interesting, especially <laughs> Egypt. I may have to have you back on sometime to talk about the Pharaoh of the Exodus and, and some of your writings around that. But I wanted to go back to something that you were talking about a little bit earlier, because I think it's really important. When we're talking about history and, and how it matches up with the Bible and identifying biblical characters historically or figures historically, I think it's really easy to make it all just an intellectual 
intellectual exercise. And Mm -hmm. I really appreciated how you brought it back to why Moses had put it there in the first place. Because the Bible's not just exhaustive history for history's sake, right? It's like it's an edited director's cut. What's in there needs to be in there for a purpose, right? It's there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that got me thinking, we were talking earlier uh, before we we uh, hit record on the on the interview today, uh, talking about application for Nimrod's life, because you talked a little bit about why Moses put it in there initially for the children of Israel. But do you think there's any application for Nimrod's life for us today? Like, can we bring that into the present? Yes, absolutely. And this is very important. I don't think any of us, Corey will have the problem any, at any point of being an empire builder. That's not going to be a temptation for us. We're, we're not going to be kings or rulers of countries. So, but here's the thing. Oftentimes in our lives, whether it's through employment or it's in church ministry or it's in um, volunteer work we do in our communities or wherever God gives us a sphere of influence, a place that we can serve, We often, each one of us, not always for every one of us, but most of us at some point in life, will have a position where we're in charge of something. However large or small, we may be a middle person, not the person ultimately in charge, but we may have this little area that that we oversee. And it's very easy for us, for pride to take over, for this insatiable power temptation to envelop us and for us to want to have something more and to control others and to get others to see our qualities and our characteristics because we're in charge and we're doing this well and so forth. Mm. And it, it all becomes something that's twisted with our pride. And of course, I'm convinced, Corey, that at the seat, at the root of any and every sin we commit, is pride, yeah. ultimately putting ourselves on a throne that only God can sit on yeah. because only he's in charge. Who are we? we? We're but clay pots. We're vessels. Um, all we want or should want is for God one day to look at us and say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, right? Yeah. That you have done all that I instructed you to do. And that's it. He doesn't want us to become an important person. He wants us to become people who show him off as an important God. That's what he wants. And when we put ourselves in positions of authority and power, the danger is that we take it and embrace it for ourselves. I remember when I was a seminary student, right? I was in my early 30s. And our professor instilled this in us, and I'll never forget it to this day. He said, he said, um, you know, when you go out and you have ministries, some of you will become in charge to some extent or another. Some of you will become assistant pastors or senior pastors. What are you going to be like? How are you going to serve? How will others look at you and understand what kind of a leader you are? And he said, he said, it's, it's not a problem at all to have a position of authority. If you're this, you know, you don't have to apologize for being the senior pastor. So here's the difference, authority and power. As you are serving as senior pastor, you can be a person who embraces power. You're going to be willing to fight other potential bodies of power within the church. Maybe it's the elders. Maybe it's the people in the church with the most money and they want their decisions to be followed, right? So it becomes a political battle. And and for me as a pastor um, in in my life, I've seen some of the ugliest things that you can see that happen in the church. Yeah. The most difficult conflicts I've ever experienced are in the church. Why? Because people end up embracing power, taking it to themselves, and not letting it go. But what did my pastor, what did my uh, my seminary professor instill in us? He said, when you get power, not position, not authority, but when you get power, he said, do three things with it. Divest it, divest it, 
divest. What does that mean? It means physically, purposefully push it away from you as hard as you can, as far as you can, for as long as you can. And you know, I tried that when I got to Siberia. I was asked to be a church planning pastor there. And of course, you know, it's, it's hard enough to be in another culture where you don't speak the language and you don't know the culture, but all of a sudden you're asked to be, you know, a church planning pastor. It was a huge responsibility. And yet I looked at that principle that he infused in us and I said, I'm not going to embrace power. Politics will not be part of my service as the pastor in this church. It won't happen. So you know what I did? Whenever anyone brought up issues in the church, you know, such, such and such a woman, you know, was wearing a skirt that was this short, you know, pastor, you need to talk to her. No, no, I'm not going to talk to her. You know why? I'm not going to take that kind of power to myself. I'm not going to be a judge because the Bible is my authority system, mm -hmm. right? For leading and serving in the church. And if the Bible doesn't address the issue that you're coming to me with to complain about, then you and I have no discussion. And I'm not going to let that issue that's not addressed in the Bible be one that I take a position on. That woman's free to wear her skirt to whatever length she wants. Now, do I hope it's not going to be something that's a stumbling block for someone else? Sure, I am. But that's not the issue. She can deal with that on her own. I'm only going to, to let issues come in my purview that the Bible addresses somehow, some way. And so I'm not going to take power. I'm not going to um, abuse my position. I'm going to divest that power. I'm going to keep the power in the word of God. Why? Because the church always belongs to Jesus Christ. I have a problem with pastors who say, you know, such and such Calvary Bible Church is my church. No, it's not your church. It was never your church. Never will be your church. Yeah. It was always the church that Jesus paid for with his own sacrificial, precious blood. He never gave it to you. Don't take it. So whenever that power is there, and again, you can apply this at work. You can apply it at school. You can apply it in your neighborhood. You can apply it in your volunteer ministry, wherever you want. In your if family. You authority, push that power away, divest, divest, divest and serve, come alongside, come under the other people who are there and allow them to see you put yourself under others and not over others. And in that, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Mm, that's awesome. The, it's, the, it's the classic story of human nature, isn't it? We, it? It's told over and over and over again in the Bible. And you'd think by this point, we'd really get the hint. <laughs> But we yeah. need to, we need to stay in it. We need to stay. It, remi it reminds me last year I did uh, um, a study on Saul, King Saul, and it's, it's his story too, of, you know, taking, taking the authority of Samuel, then taking authority like pagan kings surrounding Israel that wasn't for Israel. And it leads to this really awesome statement by Samuel. I think it's in first Samuel 22. I'll have to find it and pop it down in the description of this video, but where Samuel likens um, pride and arrogance to idolatry and divination. And uh, it's mm -hmm. just, it's that classic story, isn't it? Where, where human pride, we, we just, it takes over and we become power hungry and we just go for it when we shouldn't go for it. Right. And the other thing that Saul did is he took the office of priest to himself, but he was not part of the Levitical tribe. So he couldn't do that. And that was like the last straw that God said, okay, enough yep. is enough. You can't take those positions that don't belong to you and take, you know, put them in your own hands. So yeah, he's a great example. Wonderful example of that. All right. Well, I know we are over time, uh, but I want to, I, I want to give everyone an opportunity to know where they can buy your book, where they can follow your work. Um, and also I know that you have a, a new YouTube channel out as well. So can you tell us all these things that people can follow you and, and get into your work? Sure. Um, so the easiest way to buy my new book, Nimrod, the Empire Builder, is on Amazon. And you know how easy Amazon is. One, you know, one or two clicks and you're done. So that's the easiest way. And if you want to go that route, no problem. 
The one thing is that that would give me personally kind of the smallest royalty as the author. So um, if you're interested in helping the author even just a little bit more, the best way would be to buy it for me directly. I actually sell them out of my house. I, I have copies of my books um, for sale out of my garage, and I uh, will sign those, personally sign them and write a little inscription and send it out to you. So you could buy that directly from me using PayPal, um, and that is at Dr. Petrovich, which is at D-R-P-E-T-R-O-V-I-C-H. Or you could buy through Venmo, which is um, at Douglas, D-O-U-G-L-A-S, dash Petrovich, P-E-T-R-O-V-I-C-H. Or you could send me a check. That's fine, too. Um, so for the new book, it'd be $20 for the book and $5 for shipping and handling. So $25. So that's one way you could buy my book. Um, you could also, if you're anyone's inter interested in buying my Origins of Hebrews book, uh, I sell that for $40 um, before shipping and handling. So that's an option too. And I still have copies of that to sell. Um, you can also find my um, journal, journal articles and other things I've uploaded for free that you can download and read, no cost, on my academia.edu webpage. So all you do is type in your favorite web browser search line, academia.edu space. Douglas Petrovich, enter. And then the first link that will come up will be a link for um, my academy.edu webpage. And so you can download my articles, the two biblical books um, that I've translated. I think that's Ephesians and something else. I forget, but maybe First John is the other one. And so that's an option. Um, so, and the other thing I'll note is that, yeah, I just recently started a YouTube channel um, illumining the path is what it's called. So if you want to follow me on, uh, on that, I'll have both shorts that will be, uh, a one minute or less, my translation of a, of a verse of the Bible, and then maybe a thought or two I have about that verse all within a minute. And then, uh, longer videos that relate to areas of, you know, topics that I've taught on and so forth. And I've taught over 50 courses. So I'm going to start um, uploading lots of different videos uh, over time. And my hope is that that channel grows and swells and becomes one where um, my influence really broadens greatly and, and other people can benefit from it because now that I'm not a spring chicken anymore, it's time to really uh, put my work out there for lots more people to benefit from. That is awesome. Okay, so everyone who is listening and watching, I'm going to put some links to Dr. Petrovich's, uh, to his YouTube channel and also to his academia site in the description box. So go on over to his YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Dr. Petrovich, hang on. I'm going to say bye to everyone and then we can continue our conversation and say goodbye. But everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, if you liked this interview, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Also, if you have follow-up questions or comments, please pop them down in the comment section. I always love reading through your insights and your questions. Uh, yeah. And again, don't forget to hop on over to Dr. Petrovich's YouTube channel and subscribe to him uh, so that you don't miss any of the content that's going to be coming out on his channel. Until next week, guys, happy reading and studying. Thank you so much for watching. We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.